and yet another fascinating glimpse into the mystical world of The Witcher. But wait, there's more. Hello everyone, my name is Rafa Oyaki and I'm responsible for publishing what we call the Expanded Witcher Universe here at CD Projekt Red. Today I would like to invite you all to join me and a couple of guests on a brief journey taking a look at several of our Expanded Universe projects. Let's begin by hearing more about the creation of our Witcher comic books from their author Bartosz Tybor. Hi everyone, my name is Bartosz Tybor and you may know me as the author of some of the comic books we have released as part of the expanded Witcher universe. Today I'm going to give you some insight into these and might also have an announcement to make as well. So let's get started. The world of The Witcher is vast and rich with storytelling potential. For me, it's the perfect setting for comic books as there are so many different styles and genres open to us to explore. With fading memories, we tell a classic noir tale, but with a twist. The series treats Geralt as a private eye living in a world where there are far fewer monsters to be hunted. Geralt really has to face who he is and what he might be. It mixes the vintage pulp noir styles of Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler with postmodern anti-westerns like Unforgiven and No Country for Old Men. But in another series, we can move to an entirely different style. With Witch's Lament, we explore the horror genre, but not in the style of a slasher or a monster movie. Witch's Lament is a subversive horror story with social and moral subtext. It's a scary and symbolic tale about witches and their empowerment in fantasy tropes and takes inspiration from some of the most intelligent and original tales of its genre, like Rosemary's Baby, Don't Look Now, Get Out, Hereditary and Midsommar. The expanded Witcher universe can go in many directions, even in a single medium like comic books. And that's one of the most inspiring things about those kinds of projects. One of the cores of The Witcher, looking at books, games and TV series, is of course Geralt of Rivia. Some of my favorite Witcher moments and stories come from putting Geralt in difficult circumstances and seeing how he reacts and in comic books we get to interpret the character of Geralt from perspectives you haven't seen before. Fundamentally, Geralt is a really fascinating character to write for. He has so much going on inside of him. There are many sides of his personality, each with different motivations, which clash with each other all the time. He has so much going on inside of him. When he's a private eye, he's like Philip Marlowe, cold, but true to his credo. As a lover, he's cautious and scared of commitment. As a fighter, he's calm and precise. And as a father figure, he's protective and sensitive. I think he becomes even more interesting when these aspects mix. Like when he suddenly needs to be not only a detective, but also a father. That brings some of the internal clashes to the surface. He has layered emotions and motivations that aren't just black and white. And by using the power of comic books to put Geralt in totally different situations, you get to know him better and more deeply. In Fading Memories, we take a more melancholic approach, exploring who Geralt is when he's no longer hunting monsters. In which is Lament, we put him in a distinctly horrifying story, which gives us a characters to use him and the world around him for social and moral commentary. By showcasing this different side of Geralt in their own self-contained stories, we can relate to him in surprising and evocative ways. Of course, a comic book isn't just about the writing. For each series, we put together a creative team to make the writing, the visuals, and all the thematic elements fit perfectly together. Each team is handpicked for each series because it depends so much on the atmosphere we want to evoke and the story we want to tell. For example, the nature of fading memories meant fighting an expressionistic inker and a colorist who could create a strong sense of melancholy. It's all about attention to detail and keeping in mind what the vision is for the series. 
The same goes for the cover artist. Our main covers were very melancholic, with variants focused more on the noir side. That way, we captured all aspects of fading memories is about. For which is Lament, we wanted artists with a strong attachment to horror. We sought out artists who were specifically talented at creating a sense of darkness and dread. We treat each series as their own installation into the Witcher universe. And I think that's part of what makes comic books so special. You can pick one of the series or one volume and fall in love with it, even if you don't know who Geralt is or what the Witcher is. Using totally different genres and techniques, we use the world of the Witcher to tell emotional stories that can be accessed, understood, and most importantly, enjoyed by anybody. I see The Witcher as a universe filled with grounded stories about people's instincts, emotions, and tendencies. Since Andrzej Sapkowski's first Witcher story, that world has resonated deeply with many people, and we are trying to capture all of that and do the same thing with our comic books, not just only fading memories and Witch's Lament. I'm very proud and excited to announce here at WitcherCon, the next Witcher comic book, one that will be familiar to fans of Andrzej Sapkowski's original works. It's called A Grain of Truth, and it's an adaptation of the short story of the same name. A postmodern take of beauty and the beast. Our comic book adaptation will stay true to the roots of the short story, as we aim to bring this beautiful tale to new audiences and continue to expand the Witcher universe. But for now, that's it from me. Thank you and have a great WitcherCon. Bartosz, many thanks for taking the time to share your insights with us. If you want to get your hands on the complete Fading Memories collection, that will be out in trade paperback on the July of 28th. For Witcher Lament, the first two issues are out now, with more coming soon and the full trade paperback edition coming in December 2021. The Grain of Truth will be the first of brand new series of direct comic book adaptations of Mr. Sapkowski's short stories the latest addition to the world of the Witcher comic books are planned to be released in early 2022. All those titles will be published by our dear friends at Dark Horse Comics. But we are not done yet. We are proud to announce a special comic book project that has been in the works for some time now. Roll the trailer! Geralt is alone, Ronin Witcher hunting yokai and searching for Yukiona, the lady in the blizzard, the lady of snow. He has lost all hope. Fate has other plans. The Witcher Ronin, slicing its way onto Kickstarter soon. Together with CD Projekt Red Gear, we started to explore the Witcher Ronin world with beautiful hand-painted statues, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. So now we want to invite you into the ancient Japanese-inspired world where Geralt is a monster hunter of a different nature. As the author of the comics and a graduate of Japanese philology, I always felt that Geralt fits the mold of a Ronin-esque swordsman and connects with the samurai missiles quite well. To help bring this idea to life as authentically as possible, an amazing manga artist Hataya has agreed to lend her skill to the series. The first volume is almost finished, and if you want to learn more, please visit the Witcher Ronin Kickstarter page to stay up to date until the campaign launches. And now let's take a look at another part of the expanded Witcher universe. The Witcher Old World is an adventure board game that takes place years before Geralt was born. The world is full of professional monster slayers from all Witcher schools, and they are all competing for contracts across the continent to tell you more about it, please let me invite Łukasz Woźniak, the designer of The Witcher Old World. Welcome all Witcher fans from around the world. We are more than happy to have you here with us. Creating a board game set in The Witcher World has been our big dream for a long time, and we have poured our hearts and souls into this project. With The Witcher Old World, our goal is to create a game that will give you the opportunity to immerse yourself in the Witcher world and create your own story. You will travel, train, trail monsters, 
play dice poker and encounter a wide variety of thematic choices. And most of all, you'll fight monsters and even bro with other witchers. Years before the saga of Geralt of Rivia, when magic and beastly peril had just come to the continent, five competing witcher schools trained their adepts. Become one of the witchers. Explore the land by seeking trouble around cities and adventures in the wild. Meet folk from all around the continent and make difficult moral choices that impact your story. Use magical potions, develop your abilities, play dice poker, and master sophisticated combat techniques to brawl with other witchers and do what witchers are trained for, hunt horrible monsters. Across the vast continent, dangers abound. Each beast has their unique abilities, which makes fighting them a real challenge. You'll face Lesh, Fiend, Harpy, and many more. Killing monsters and collecting their trophies is the best way to prove your courage and skill. Each Witcher starts their adventure with a deck of cards that will grow as they travel around the map. For combat, you will use strong or fast attacks, dodges, and powerful magic signs to your advantage. Create mighty combos to defeat your foes. Prepare your deck to be the last man standing in every fight and become the best Witcher in the Old World. The Witcher Old World is available as a late pledge on Project's Kickstarter page. Many thanks to all of you for joining us in this journey into the expanded Witcher universe. We hope you will enjoy all the stories and experiences we have prepared for you. And last but not least, have a great Witcher Con. Hello everyone, uh, we are here today to talk to you a little bit about how we make the stories for our Witcher games. I work as a lead acting quest designer in Warsaw and with me is Boazie. Hello, uh, I'm Boazie Augustynek, I'm the acting lead quest designer for Kraków, uh, the Krakow studio. Uh, I've worked on The Witcher and Cyberpunk, been in the studio for seven or eight years I think. So we introduced ourselves as quest designers, so maybe let's actually go maybe a little bit into detail about how one of these quests, one of these stories is created. So as I said before, we essentially always start with the question of, you know, what is the topic of this quest? What is the theme? And once we pretty much know what are the interesting topics that interest us, we basically go to the next stage where I think, you know, it's a very common thing in the story business. We essentially pitch a story. And this can be done by the quest designers or of course by our best friends in the studio, the, writers. the story writers. Yes. Uh, we always work as a, you know, a very close-knit team. And basically we write the story in a very short form to basically, you know, give interesting glimpses in it. And then we of course, you know, have the lead quest designers, we have the directors who basically check these pitches and pretty much choose their favorites. And if your pitch is chosen, then comes the next very interesting part, which is called the quest design. And there we essentially write down the whole quest from start to finish in its full form. So basically when you read this document uh, in your head, in the best case scenario, you can already imagine the way it would play. Uh, this is of course a very challenging thing because our stories are not linear. You're not going from A to B to Z. You can make lots yeah, of choices you need in the story. Yeah, yes, right? you actually need to show it visually <laughs> so people pictures, know. Graphs. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. oh, here's this direction going up there, but there's another one. And then they go together again. And this is a thing that we actually have as a challenge to really represent. Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading this quest design, I can follow all the different directions the story can go in, all the choices and consequences, the consequences that come from these choices. And basically, of course, as always, it goes through multiple iterations. Once it's accepted, then comes the fun part, and we actually start implementing the quest yes, into the yes. game engine, and we work with lots of different teams, and, and you that, can talk a bit about that. Yeah, and in that moment, uh, the quest designer becomes uh, kind of like a spider in, inside the <laughs> net, uh, because we have contact with pretty much everyone on the team, every specialty, and there is, there is a lot of specialties of people that uh, work 
uh, on in in making games. So we've got your. I'm gonna forget someone, and I'm I'm, I'm just gonna say I'm sorry if I forgot <laughs> about you. <laughs> but you've got like your Enviro artists, your level designers, your gameplay designers. You've got uh, writers, obviously mm-hmm. cinematic designers, FX artists, um, audio uh, designers. Um, there's there's more, and uh, we basically talk to them. Uh, we send them documents. We talk to them. Uh, we organize all the stuff. We try to sell them uh, our vision, basically. Um, and uh, sometimes there's interesting stuff happening because we we talk, yes, but we need to listen as well. Yeah. Because there's uh, sometimes there's stuff happening that we we would have wouldn't have thought that um, ourselves basically. So there's this uh, example I can give you when I was working on on, on a little document when I uh, designing outlining the, the location of Tucson in uh, Blood and Wine in mm-hmm. the expansion. And um, I was going through the book and just looking at what loca- locations were mentioned, and putting them down in the document, trying to put them on the map, etc. And this created like a rough outline of uh, how the world is going to look like. And then handed it over to other teams. Um, then it lived with its own life. Uh, they asked me questions sometimes. And then I uh, got to open up the world in the game editor that we work in. Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw additional places that were uh, between the connection, that were connecting the places that I mentioned, they, they logically made sense. And I remember the sense of, I mean, I would call it awe, really. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, when I saw, uh, there was a quarry and uh, there was a river, right? And the, 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 um, the story was that uh, the stone from the quarry was transported um, in the river, right? Mm-hmm. Um, by, by boat. And so, uh, it, it's it's a little thing, but it really impressed me that uh, they actually connected the two places with like a canal, uh, because that made sense, yeah, right, logically. I didn't think of it; they did. <laughs> yeah, that is the thing that you know we always like. You know, when we talk about oh, we're we're making the quests, but that's not really the case. We're kind of let's say responsible for the quest coming mm-hmm. together, but it's this whole collaborative work that everyone yes. actually chips in. And you know, not necessarily even just in their specific specialty. Yeah, uh, often like some of my best, you know, like story twists, story decisions in my quests were ideas that just, you know, team members had when, you know, we were playing the quest together or just talking to each other. And that's also, you know, let's say an important thing to, like for us to never be someone who says like, this is my specialty, this is the job I do, because that's mm-hmm. not how we make games. Yeah. We make games as a team. We all love making Witcher games, and everyone has their ideas. So I think, you know, as you said, like one of our biggest, most important things in our jobs is to listen and to just talk mm-hmm. to each other because everyone wants to make the best game possible. And I think if you pretty much keep doing that, then you know there's a good chance that you're yeah. going to make a good game. On that stage, there's surprisingly little st- little time that we spend in front of a computer, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we basically spend a lot of time just. Yeah talking to each other, yeah. which is good, because, you know, you kind of need this basis to then actually start making the quest that your people are actually going to play. So in our Witcher games, one of the, I think, most famous aspects is, of course, uh, as I said earlier, that we're not telling linear stories that go from A to B to Z, because there is a player involved. So our games aren't, let's say, a monologue of the mm-hmm. author telling you what happens. They are a dialogue, because you, as a player, can make choices that just change the flow of the whole story. And because our games are pretty long, there's often hundreds of these choices. And of course, a choice is only good if it has a really good consequence. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) let's talk a little bit about the choice Uh, and consequence. Yes. So uh, one thing is that uh, I I kind of mentioned this already before. The choices need to feel appropriate for the situation. Mm -hmm. They need to feel natural in, in the moment, in the context of what's going on. Uh, but the other thing that needs to happen as well is the choices need to fit uh, Geralt as a character yeah. that you're inhabiting because this is a role-playing game, right? So you are playing his role. And, um, you know, we always have these discussions where we, um, we use this, this term that, no, Geralt wouldn't do that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a challenge sometimes. But uh, thankfully, uh, Geralt is uh, an internally torn character Mm -hmm. because he is striving to be professional, neutral, he's trying to uphold this this, um, mythos of being a witcher, right? 
Um, but on the other hand, internally, he's, you know, um, a good guy, basically. He's almost like a white knight. He's trying not to be. Yeah, he would because... never admit it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, sometimes he does. He does look like a black metal, uh, you know, uh, band guy. But internally, he's warm and fuzzy, and you know, he he's a really cool, cool friend. Uh, you mentioned his humor, right? Uh, yeah, as well. yeah. That's something that's uh, surprising when you first hear it. Uh, but yeah, going back to those to those choices, um, th- 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 this gives us like a range. Uh, of approaches to any given situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of this comes out of the context, but uh, some of it comes out, comes out of uh, him as a person and uh, this dichotomy that he has within himself where he tries to, you know, he can be, you can play him as just the neutral professional, maybe slightly cynic uh, kind of guy, or you can play him as, uh, you know, white knight basically and just yeah. uh, helping everyone well it's also the thing that's often a bit of a head scratcher uh, when we start with our quests is often this questions of why would Geralt even like help these people why would he even mm. do that yes. because that's actually a question that is important because usually in video games well your character does it because you're a player and you want to do it yeah but you're playing Geralt you're of Rivia one, right? exactly <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> like you you just he just doesn't do yeah. anything so there always needs to be this specific reason that like interests him mm-hmm. and when we do these choices and consequences we also want to make it so the player is actually interested in making those uh, because you always feel let's say if you have choices in a story and they're very clearly you know this is the good choice this is the evil choice this is the stupid choice then it's kind of boring then you're not using your head uh, we actually try to keep it you know a bit more interesting earlier we talked about how we make mature stories and we really can't use the evil choice because Geralt is not evil. Geralt wouldn't do that. Right? Yeah, like you can't have a choice where Geralt's just, you know, yeah. yes, I'm gonna slaughter all the innocent people. That's just, you know, nothing that our, would make sense Well, in it our did stories. happen in Blaviken, though. With? But that's the thing. In but Blaviken, the innocent? Because so. that's the thing. Because <laughs> even in the books and in our games, the choices aren't just good or evil. Usually, mm. it's a really difficult choice to make. And as an example, in Blaviken, which of mm. course, you know, fans of the Netflix series might have seen as well, uh, there is a very difficult choice that Geralt has to make there. And as an example, if this was uh, a quest in the game, that might be an available choice to, you know, fight uh, yes. Renfri and, his, and her people. But the thing is, maybe we would also then have to give you context for maybe Geralt doesn't fight him. Maybe Geralt actually, you know, through whatever story thing happens, could help them. But then, of course, you know, when it comes to Blaviken, this would result in really dire and big consequences. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that we pretty much have to handle, that every choice needs to have a really interesting consequence. And the thing is, these consequences can't just be surprises. Like, you can't just make a choice and then an hour later, oh, a thing happens now. Uh, they can be surprising, but if it's a good, let's say, choice and consequence, you always know, you know, where it's sense. coming from. It exactly, they have to make some logical sense, even if they are surprising. Yeah, and yeah. if you have a lot of these choices, and you said you want to have hundreds of them, yeah. uh, that means a lot of consequences, and a lot of consequences means that uh, the structure of the game has uh, the potential of becoming unmanageable, because there's so many alternate realities that you create when you when you choose stuff mm-hmm. um, that uh, we as developers need to handle um, that we do uh, this thing where we create convergence points mm-hmm. uh, one example of this is the Battle of Kaer Morhen, uh, who was uh, which was uh, made by Pavel Sasko um, our lead quest designer right now um, and uh, this is a point where kind of all the things that uh, happened before it um, have their effect and uh, they have their consequences and you can see them play out beat by beat basically uh, throughout the whole uh, defense of Kaer Morhen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very rewarding experience because it feels like everything you did at this point mattered. right? But for us as developers uh, it's helpful because we kind of close that topic and mm-hmm. we move on with the story. Yeah, all those different things that are flowing mm-hmm. around, they all just can come yeah. together again, and then we pretty much know yeah. where we are. And then we can use them here and there, mm-hmm. but the whole story is uh, the story arc is closed. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much also one of the most 
you know, let's say the unique thing about our Witcher games, which is that you are actually an active participant in the story. You shape the way the story goes. You are, you know, you are Geralt of Rivia or you are Ciri and you make these choices for these characters. And as an example, you know, if you feel like, you know, Sultan is Geralt's friend, now he's also your friend and you mm -hmm. talk to him in yeah, a way. Personal, right? Exactly. And you kind of feel very attached to them and it's pretty much your adventure. And I think one of the absolutely coolest things about my job is to, you know, after the game is out, when you hear people talking about, as an example, my quests, and they talk about the story and they just have completely different experiences. Like someone made a choice that's completely different than another one has, or, you know, maybe they get the, both the same result, but one is angry about it and the other one loves it and they think, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And this is actually what I really like about it. And that's why it's actually fun to do these non-linear stories where people can actually be this active participant. And I think that's kind of what makes the games really special.